problem. Um, and really the situation uh, that exists with the social studies and the Common Core state standards. I'm going to make sure that I have control of the screen so I can take you forward, and I do. Um, again, good afternoon. My name is Don Racino. I'm the Director of Marketing for Herf Jones Nystrom. Um, for those who aren't aware of who we are, Herf Jones Nystrom has been a leading publisher in the world of social studies and helping to improve the quality of education uh, by partnering with districts uh, for over 100 years. And I'm very happy to introduce, he's a returning guest for us, guest speaker, Mr. Robert Austin. Robert, can you say hello? Hello. Thanks, Don. Robert um, is out of the Utah State Office of Education. He's uh, a K-12 education specialist for social studies. Um, he also works with professional development and just all areas of, of education. And he is a great authority figure to have joining us for the second time. Um, so uh, thanks again, Robert, for joining us. We're going to get to Robert's presentation in, in just one moment. Um, we really do, as those who have joined us before for our presentations, we do want to see this be interactive. So um, we expect that you'll have questions throughout this, and we want you to start uh, using the chat feature on your uh, GoToMeeting panel and use that to send us any of your um, questions that you have for Robert throughout this. And as a growing number of educators are connecting socially using social media, especially Twitter, um, we will be live tweeting uh, this event uh, using our uh, Twitter handle, which is HJ Nystrom, and using the hashtag CCSS half, so, uh, which probably tells you that Robert's really going to talk about what the right path is for social studies um, and the Common Core State Standards. Uh, but just to, to, to introduce Robert and the subject properly, um, if we really think about the mood that's being set out there, really the state of social studies right now, um, things are sort of in flux. We know that uh, social studies is being mentioned in the standards uh, in the area of English language arts, but there are also a number of articles being written about this subject and what's happening. Um, and Robert had also uh, talked about this subject with us about a year ago, um, and you know everything was looking great. And I'll let him speak to that. But now, since that time, um, where do we stand? And there's this article that's very recent from district administration. Uh, and you can see the title of this article, that the social studies are on the outside looking in. Mm, doesn't, doesn't sound great for us. Um, how about Washington Post, another one from New York area educator Stephen Lazar, uh, saying that he's seeing the opportunity for social studies, and I think specifically history, uh, being squandered. So where are things today? Those don't really paint a rosy picture, um, but we, we believe there's a pathway here for social studies. So at this point, I'm going to quiet down and reintroduce Mr. Robert Austin to take us through his presentation and help us navigate uh, the issues of, of the Common Core State Standards and Social Studies. So Robert, it's all, all yours. Great. Thanks, Don. You know, I want to give a little context, and before that, I, I really want to thank all of those who are listening as well. I, I feel um, very honored to be able to just share some thoughts, and I hope we can really think of this as a conversation, because we all care deeply about social studies. And I think that the critical first thing is to understand that the title for today is Houston, We Have a Problem, but the context is that in 2011, I did present a webinar called A Sputnik Moment, The Common Core in Social Studies, and I talked about the real opportunity that we held in our hands at that time as people who care about social studies and who realize just the, the critical um, moment that the Common Core offers us in terms of the kinds of skills that are called for in the Common Core. The, um, the Common Core standards really promise, and still promise, a viable opportunity to stake the claim that the social studies are a critical component in achieving our goal of college, career, and civic readiness. This idea of the necessity of conducting independent research, of crafting an argument, of understanding reliable uh, information and making sure that we can vet our sources, all the kinds of literacy expectations and more uh, that are spelled out specifically in the Common Core Standards in ELA 
and literacy in social studies, history, science, and technical subjects. Those are absolutely um, such an essential part of social studies that it seems it seemed like we have a real opportunity to seize the moment in terms of reclaiming the central notion, the centrality of social studies. Um, you know, I talk very often about how the whole purpose of public education is to create socially competent um, members of society, and social studies is, is at the heart of that. So we have this moment when we really uh, know where we need to go, and in order to do that work, we have clarity about the kind of path forward, and my concern is that we are um, losing that sense of clarity and losing that vision. And that brings us to this concept of, Houston, we have a problem, as a follow-up to that Sputnik moment. Now, I think that it's important to know that in the movie about Apollo uh, 13, that we had a um, happy ending. I hate to spoil it for those who haven't seen the movie. And I think we can have a happy ending still for the implementation of the Common Core state standards and, and the implications for social studies. But we have to really make a concerted effort to lead out on that topic. And, and that's why I'm so excited about the range of people who are listening and the range of people who are engaging in this conversation. I mean, frankly, I'm excited about the fact that Don brought up the article from Stephen Lazar earlier who is a classroom teacher, who blogs, who's active, who takes it upon himself to be a participant in this conversation. Because it gets to that whole point that every one of us leads, every one of us who cares about this issue and about how our students have got to have a rich and robust and fascinating and fun uh, social studies experience every day in elementary and throughout their high school years um, it means that we all have to lead on this. And so everyone leads. Um, and that's actually the title of one of my favorite books, is this idea that um, as we move forward, we all think about the kinds of ways that we can lead out on this. Um, in this quote from Matthew Fox, it says, the times do not allow anyone the luxury of waiting around for others to lead. All can lead and ought to be invited to do so. Part of the challenge for us in social studies is helping our students understand that they have a role and a responsibility and an obligation to be leaders and to think about their role in, in civic life. And frankly, we all have to have that same uh, commitment as educators. The, the problem is that there are significant problems. There are absolutely um, core problems that we have to face if we're going to think strongly about implementation of social studies in in the classroom, in the, in the new ways that are called for in the Common Core. The first, I think, still very significant problem is that social studies is not taught in a comprehensive, integrated approach in the elementary schools. We have this diet of nuggets. Instead of some kind of well-balanced diet of all the core subjects, we have a little bit about George Washington in the story, and then maybe some information about Rosa Parks, and then maybe an essay about Peru, and you've got nothing for um, students to really stick their cognitive schema to. The second problem, very quickly, and I'm going to kind of run through a number of problems that I see and challenges, and then I'm going to talk about um, how we can flip some of those challenges into, into opportunities. So the second problem is this continuing focus um, in an, an amazing way on STEM, 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 STEM. Um, but this incredible amount of attention being spent on core areas of science or mathematics um, is a little bit like that bodybuilder who works only on his upper body but forgets his legs. And social studies is the legs upon which everything is built. And if you're going to be a scientist and make the kinds of decisions that you need to make, you still have to make those decisions within the context of the kinds of things you learn in the social studies classroom. You know, my, my colleagues uh, talk about um, the fact that while everyone, not everyone will be a, a mathematician or a scientist, but every single student will have the job of citizen. And we've got to continually uh, remind people about that. The third 
continuing drumbeat is um, at the elementary level is this focus, unrelenting focus on literacy. And um, in the article that Don was talking about early on from district administration, there's a quote from the from the author talking about how, and he says, quote, the Common Core State Standards say little about social studies as a core curricular subject. Instead, in the K-5 standards, social studies are lumped within nonfiction reading and literacy standards under the hard science and technical subjects. While grades 6 through 12 get some direction, standards still focus on social studies as a means toward nonfiction literacy. So we're going to talk about that claim that, that Andrew makes, but um, definitely literacy at all costs um, means that we are losing out in terms of the kinds of time and attention we can spend uh, specifically focusing on social studies and definitely at the, at the elementary level. Problem four is just that there's relentless testing. Testing, testing, testing. I go visit an elementary school and the teacher says, well, you know, really don't worry too much about social studies today because we are in testing mode and in, instead of actually giving kids the time to really struggle with and, and work on some of the key concepts that are essential in social studies, they're busy taking yet another test. Um, and, you know, sometimes those tests themselves are pretty hit and miss in terms of the kinds of cognitive rigor and demands they're asking. Um, so that's definitely a continuing problem that we have to face. But the, on top of the, that testing piece is the fact that we've got whole new assessment systems built on um, linking teacher effectiveness to student achievement, so you're going to have even more of a focus on the traditionally tested high-stakes subjects of math and literacy as people's performance is tied into student achievement, especially, again, at the elementary grades. Another problem is just the, the status quo, the fact that we, if we're going to make any kind of significant change, we have to deal with the fact that we are moving people away from the way they've always done it. And the kind of implementation that we're talking about in terms of these core standards, it's going to require change. And we can't continue to provide instruction in the same ways we always have been and then expect different results from our students. You just can't expect that. It's irrational to think that we in the classroom don't have to change our instruction. We have to think about the kinds of ways we're going to really meet the kinds of cognitive demands that are called for in the Common Core State Standards. Another challenge is that, you know, having a plan is hard. And it's, there's a lot of confusion, frankly, about which direction do we go and how do we do this. And one of my favorite sayings here is that teaching is easy if you don't know how. Because it's this riddle for us that suddenly when you get very clear about where you need to go and how how much work is in, involved, you realize that this this is a complex challenge. What we have with these new standards is an opportunity to push for levels of rigor, levels of thinking, levels of writing, speaking, listening that we've not had before. And Tying that um, and moving forward without some kind of plan um, will give us exactly where these road, road signs are showing us. So that's problem six. Problem seven is just that there is definitely still confusion about what the Common Core standards actually are. Who wrote them? Where did they come from? What do they mean? Um, what does that mean for social studies? And um, what kinds of strings are attached to the adoption of the standards? What does that mean for classroom practice? You name it. Confusion reigns. And finally, there's some real concern on the part of a number of teachers who I've spoken with who say and look at and study and do a close reading of the Common Core State Standards who say, you know, these are great. These are fantastic goals. But my students, my students really can't do this work. Um, 
it's just beyond their capabilities. So I've kind of laid I out you there for a second. Please, yeah, please do. Um, when when you have teachers who are telling you that and say that they simply their students simply can't do this work. What is your response to that when they have, you know, they're in a state that has adopted the standards and the testing is looming? Um, they certainly can't just give up. So if you don't mind, uh, what kind of advice do you usually provide to someone who says that their students can't do that? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's really easy when you're not in the classroom, but I can tell you that what, what we know about students and about, about expectation is that students rise to levels of expectation, number one. That number two, um, one of these great opportunities about the standards is giving us clarity about the path we need to go. And if we get clear about where we need to go, then we can start moving backwards from that end goal and start thinking about the kinds of things we need to do in our classrooms to make the kinds of instructional changes so that kids actually can achieve. I think that um, you know you wouldn't take students up to the top of a mountain in Utah and tell them to ski down the black diamond run without practicing on the bunny hill first. But you definitely at least get kids on the bunny hill and you get them working on it. And so you start in on the work that we have at hand. When I tell people, when when I hear um, teachers say that my my students can't do this or you know my kids can't. Um, I tell them, you know, isn't that awesome? You're a teacher, and that's job security. Because if your kids can't do something, then you're obviously now very clearly aware of what it is that you need to teach. There's nothing more clarifying for us um, than to understand the gap analysis between where we want kids to go and what they currently are able to do. Um, and so I think that we've got some real um, some great opportunities here, and I think that the biggest, one of the biggest obstacles for all of us is having a belief that kids can, and having a belief that um, it's worth trying. None of us got into education believing that kids couldn't do something. We got into education because we believed that kids could do it. And so um, I think that that's, that's the message that I hope people resonate with, is that, yeah, this is hard work. Nothing worth doing is necessarily going to be easy, um, but you know that's that's why we're here. Um, so I think we have some great opportunities. I think we have some some great opportunities to to take some of these problems and then um, talk about them in ways that I think will help teachers understand the central role of social studies and understand um, why it's imperative that social studies is an essential part of every day. And I, I'd like to start this with just thinking about this whole concept of, of nuggets. You know, if our elementary days are just tiny little nuggets of a story here and a story there and not any kind of rich background knowledge, then we, we really um, do a, an incredible disservice to our students. So. I think about it when I think about the fact that I've been to Washington, D.C. a number of times now, but the first time I was ever in Washington, D.C., I went to the Lincoln Memorial, and as I walked up the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, I was overcome with emotion. And I was overcome with emotion because I had images of Lincoln and his sacrifice. I had images of Marian Anderson and her Easter concert in 1939. I had images of Martin Luther King Jr. and his dream so I'm on the steps of this, of this Greek revival temple, and my mind was both there and in all those other places across time. And it's because I had the gift of background knowledge. I had this gift given to me by teachers who cared about making sure I had a rich background. Um, and I was able to place that memorial in context. I was able to see the range of events throughout history that it had transpired. Um, to help make its creation and also to ground its marble steps as a place to continue to make history. Um, we want our students to have a rich inner life. We want them to be um, able to achieve the kinds of academic success that they need that's called for in the Common Core Standards. 
And if they don't have uh, the academic vocabulary and broad content knowledge, then they're not going to be able to, to connect the dots to, to make that rich inner life occur for them. Robert, we, we have a, a, a question coming in that, that touches in uh, on this exact point that you're making here. Um, and, and the person is asking, what do I say to my peers and, and my school leaders and administration to help them understand the importance of social studies within the curriculum? And I think you're really touching upon the answer and saying, you know, without, without the social studies, it, you're, you're going to miss out on the critical background knowledge, the academic vocabulary that's needed to be successful, um, not just academically, but to, to lead a, a fuller life, uh, to be a good citizen, and so forth. So if you could just expand on that maybe a little more. Yeah. What, well, what are exactly. some ways that they can really, you know, un help their, their colleagues or their administration understand this? Right. I think that... Um, one of the critical pieces is understanding just how important a robust vocabulary is. Um, students who are reading more and more nonfiction text and who can see within those nonfiction texts the, the repetition of the rare words and difficult concepts, and they engage in that conversation and they engage in making sense of those words. It, it builds and builds and builds so that they have access then to more complex texts in each grade level, in, in each step of the way through their education. And what we find is that if we don't offer this kind of richness to kids, the whole range of kids, then they fall farther and farther behind. You have to be able to have some kind of uh, system of being able to understand the big picture. Um, if we think about helping students place themselves in time and space in geography, helping them understand where they fit in the broad scheme of history, and being able to begin to um, build the schema, especially for students who don't have the kind of life experiences, um, that's not something that's just kind of a nice thing to do. It's absolutely essential. I mean, there was a, a recent white paper that Herb Jones-Nystrom put out talking about the importance of this, of this broad content knowledge and the importance of having students um, really engage in the kinds of cognitive work within social studies context, science context, you know, all the different kinds of ways that, that different texts engage us. Um, you know, everything is a text. We've got maps that are texts. We've got primary source documents that are texts. And there are specific ways that social studies disciplines, that historians or social scientists or um, political scientists or econ economists or geographers really see and learn and read and understand the world that students have to have access to when they're, when they're, uh, as they're young and as they're growing up. The, um, the issue is that if we don't do this, um, and if we don't provide that kind of background knowledge, then students really don't have the cognitive map upon which they can place um, these other concepts. So, the I was just thinking about Walter Parker and his work in elementary education and, and his own story at the beginning of one of the textbooks that he writes talks about his teacher really just emphasizing and celebrating all the different kinds of background knowledge that she could bring to the class. So that those kids appeared smart. Those kids appeared like they knew what they were talking about when they moved on into next grades. And if we're talking about expectation and we're talking about teachers um, building on the expectations they have for their kids. If you have students walking into a new classroom who seem smart, you're going to have teachers who just continually reinforce that, those smarts. Um, if, we, if we think about it in terms of things like, um, I'm reminded of a poem I think by Langston Hughes that talks about um, two folks who are talking and, and the, the one asks her friend, uh, where he's going to summer, um, and summer has suddenly become a verb instead of a noun, and and 
she's clearly got a lot more money than he does, and he's ask, she's asking where he's going to summer. And, you know, while visions of the Hamptons or Cape Cod or the Bahamas come to mind, for him it was a really simple answer. He was going to summer on the stoop, and that's where he was going to summer. And for kids who are off summering in the Bahamas, you know, it's very simple to be able to understand and, and make the connection and background knowledge between where they are and Christopher Columbus sailing across the ocean blue. But if you don't have that background knowledge, if you've got other funds of knowledge, other background, um, you're not going to be able to access the kinds of narratives that you're going to encounter in school. Um, so we have to think about all the kinds of ways we can um, encourage and support that, that background knowledge. The second problem that I talked about in terms of STEM and this whole idea about this relentless power of STEM, I think that we need to think about and celebrate the fact that the scientific method itself isn't owned by science, that it's a, a model of inquiry that we need to celebrate. We need to think about the kinds of language that is being shared and used in discussions around STEM and talk about the ways that social studies can support the same kinds of outcomes that we want in different ways, in different ways of looking at the, the discipline, but definitely uh, inquiry is not something um, saved just for the scientist. You know, the same thing is that, um, well, I do think, when I think about inquiry, I mean, even, even kindergartners can do inquiry. Um, you ask a kindergartner, you know, who's the most important person in town, and you give them a hypothesis, and they say, well, the mayor is the most important person in town, and then you have the fire chief come in and they have to analyze whether it's now the fire chief or the mayor or then the garbage man comes in and talks and you suddenly have to decide again from the data set you've been given who is the most important person in town. Well, kids can do that and that kind of inquiry um, is again not just something that is owned by science. It's something that we can all celebrate. Um, science and math share very similar habits of thinking with us in social studies. The actual core standards for mathematical practices in the Common Core um, ask students to, to make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Now that sounds like a social studies attribute. Or construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. Or attend to precision. I mean, these are all, again, things that we can um, argue are essential components of the kind of work we're doing we're doing and totally supportive of the outcomes that we want to have in any kind of emphasis on STEM. And then finally, you know, geography is in and of itself a geographic science. I mean, the kinds of inquiry and the kinds of work that real geographers do in their lives uh, is definitely an incredible connection to the scientific world. So I think we definitely have some opportunities to con continue to enlarge the conversation about where we fit in terms of the other disciplines and how we complement that work. And complementing that work, I think that, um, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, social studies is being subsumed by literacy, or somehow the history class is going to simply be nothing more than a place where kids learn to read nonfiction. Well, that's, that's not how I read the Common Core Standards. To be begin with, the Common Core Standards in ELA in K-5 through are just that. They're English language art standards. But the beautiful thing is you can't achieve the kinds of literacy goals that are called for in ELA K-5 through without teaching social studies. You just cannot do it. There is no way kids are going to be successful as they progress through school without rich experiences in understanding and decoding primary sources, looking at more and more nonfiction, understanding maps, understanding uh, bar graphs, understanding and analyzing all the kinds of texts that social studies brings to the classroom, and frankly, uh, doing the speaking and listening pieces that are essential um, in the social studies classroom. The, the thing that I want us to really think about is that you know, just like when we see the word doctor, a lot of us immediately think of <clears throat> usually a guy in a white lab coat. That's just the image that comes to our head. Well, that image is very antiquated and obviously needs to be expanded 
in a definition of doctor, well, the definition of literacy has to be expanded as well. We have to understand when we're talking about literacy, especially in the social studies classroom, we're talking about historical literacy. That means kids can analyze historical texts, can understand how historical knowledge is constructed, and frankly, can independently construct and write interpretations of the past based on historical evidence. I mean, actually writing history, that is a incredible way for kids to learn and to develop their own literacy skills, while at the same time learning the kinds of content that uh, is essential in social studies. We need kids to be economically literate. I mean, economic literacy would certainly help us now uh, in these times, and kids, I think, I think that resonates with people around the country in terms of the importance of understanding economic systems, economic data, key economic concepts, it's a definite economic literacy is a, a critical component of social studies. Civic literacy. <clears throat> when, we mean, when we talk about kids who are being civically literate, they can share an understanding and dedication to the Constitution, the constitutional principles. They've internalized these core values. They can participate in civic behaviors. They can ask questions. They can challenge authority. They can um, participate in all the processes of government, whether it's you know, school government, local government, national government they can understand their civic literacy obligations. And finally, ge geographic literacy. I mean, when we talk about literacy, <clears throat> we need to see and celebrate the fact that geographers have to be literate to be able to do the kinds of things they do, to ask the questions of why and why there and where and, and, and why there. Um, so I think that what we sometimes worry about is is we have this very, very limited definition of what literacy means. And if we embrace the fact that we are all trying to make sure we raise literate children, and then embrace the fact that that means that history, economics, civics, geography, and certainly the other uh, behavioral sciences all bring their own unique ways of helping kids become literate, then I think that we can win the argument that um, we need to have a central role in the implementation of these standards. You know, one of the things that we're seeing is people around the country saying um, literacy is the essential goal. And even though literacy is the essential goal, the content that we need to teach can be the vehicle through which that literacy is achieved. And so you really flip the goal of your work in a classroom from teaching history to making sure kids are literate and you're going to make them literate and make them be able to craft an argument or stake a claim or do independent research all the kinds of things we want kids to be able to do especially writing especially writing because we know what a gatekeeping skill that is and we do that by getting clear about our our the path forward and you know one of the one of the resources out there that um, a lot of states are looking at and a lot of districts are looking at is this concept of a literacy design collaborative where they've taken specific tasks, specific literacy tasks, pulled out the actual content, and you you import whatever content it is that you're trying to teach into these um, basically fill in the blank literacy tasks. Well, you know, no teaching is just filling in the blanks and it's complicated, but it's, on the, it's in the right path, it's going in the right direction of making sure we say, you know what, we have an obligation and an opportunity to participate in this vision of literacy and we're not going to shirk from that duty. I think another hugely important opportunity is for us to engage in the conversation around testing. <clears throat> we have a real opportunity across the country to not sit idly by but to get in the game when it comes to testing. Assessment, for many states, um, there isn't a, a necessarily a statewide assessment in social studies, and many social studies teachers have kind of a ramshackle approach to assessment, honestly, and we um, really need to think about how we can participate in the conversation so we can make sure that the assessments that are being created and the kinds of systems that are being created can be leveraged for the kinds of things we want to have happening in our classrooms. Um, there are, in the tested, tested areas are, are one place, but even in non-tested subjects. For example, in Utah, we don't have a statewide assessment. 
but we're looking at teacher evaluation plans and teacher performance plans, and people are looking at things like um, student learning objectives, or they're also called student growth objectives around the world, around the states, where people are getting very specific and clear about um, how do we assess student achievement in a classroom that doesn't have a traditional test. So, you know, we have absolutely a legitimate question on the part of a principal to say, well, how do you know your kids are being successful? So if you're, you're crafting a student learning objective where you say, my students, or a majority of my students, or 80% of my students, are going to be able to craft an argument. They're going to look at four documents, and they're going to be able to craft an argument for why you know, this position is accurate, or you know, this is the position we should take, or whatever that if you, if you lay that out there as a student learning objective, then what happens is, and what's happening in Utah, is teachers say, okay, if I want my kids to argue, if I want them to learn how to learn that skill, I'm going to have to start doing it. I'm going to have to start teaching them how to actually do it. And so what we can have is, instead of people teaching toward the test, okay, we're going to create assessments that we really want people to strive for. So. If, if we're worried that people are going to teach to, to the test, let's make sure that the tests that we want to create are worth teaching toward. And I think we have to be a part of the conversation. We have to say to our district people, to our state people who are working on ELA assessments or science assessments, hey, where do we fit in here? How can we have a, a conversation? How can we be a part of this conversation? Um, Robert, there's a, there's a question that, that sort of focused on this issue. In, in um, it says, in your opinion, do you think that a student body can achieve at the level that's expected of them once Common Core State testing actually goes online, and can that grow year after year? I, th I think that we, I just had a conversation earlier today with my state social studies leaders, and we were looking at the assessment systems that are being developed here in Utah. The, the possibilities moving forward, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, um, bells and whistles, and but I am talking about the kinds of assessment systems that we can put in place that will be instructive both for kids and also for us as, as educators. I think we're, we're on the edge of some amazing opportunities in terms of both formative assessment where we as teachers can really see what our students know and how can we adjust our instruction to help them learn the kinds of things we care about and want them to know. And the second thing is that whole summative assessment piece where we can honestly say at the end of the year, okay, well, it's, it's too late for this year, but it's not too late for next year. So you've got both formative assessment opportunities that will help inform our instruction on a regular basis in the classroom every year, and also I think some real opportunities for kind of cost-effective, um, real assessment that kind of, you know, one of the things that um, has always been a struggle for me personally around assessment is that I didn't want assessment that would be at the lowest common denominator of assessment, of just, you know, what was the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and then four different dates, and not that there aren't legitimate purposes for multiple choice, not that there aren't legi legitimate purposes for some of the other styles of assessment that we've had, but we are really on the cusp of some capabilities in assessment and in scoring that I think will push our instruction and help kids know how they're doing. And I think we just have to be a part of the conversation or we're going to miss out. And the kinds of assessments that get created aren't, aren't the kinds of assessments that we want. I think it leads us to this, um, the idea that we have to make some instructional shifts. We, we have to think about what is it that we're asking of our students. What are we really wanting to make sure students are doing in our classes um, if we really want the kinds of student achievement called for in the Common Core? And part of what I really want to think about is thinking about how we use performance and student performance as assessment. You know, when we think about every other discipline in a, in a school, when you think about PE class, um, 
what are they doing in PE class? They're doing PE. They're running, skipping, jumping, swinging golf clubs, playing basketball, whatever. In cooking class, students are cooking. In automotive mechanics, they're you know, working on a car. But in history class, or in geography, or in civics, or economics, very often students aren't actually creating. They're not doing the kinds of things that they need to be doing. They're not creating the kinds of performances that we can then use as assessment. In a history class, they might be actually receiving some kind of historical narrative, some kind of story that they're going to then reassemble on some assessment. In some, I mean, and by that, I, mean, I don't mean some kind of new independent research. I mean regurgitate the information. Or they're going to memorize a map. Or they're going to learn the three branches of government again for the fourth time. But to actually have them doing the act of being a historian, of engaging in independent research, of crafting new inter interpretations based on evidence, um, thinking about the patterns that, that we face. Um, when we think about this, I mean, I love this image here of the Facebook patterns. I mean, I just think about how students in a geography class are not going to be just knowing where the United States is, but also why these patterns, how do you read between the lines, not just color in the lines, but how do you read between the lines to see why is China this vast blackness when it comes to um, Facebook what, what is it about the about you know sub-Saharan Africa? What is it about these the, the coastal regions that are so lit up? Uh, I mean, there are so many opportunities here, so many opportunities for rich, um, incredible work around legitimate tasks that we give students. Um, and there are some, there, we don't have to create everything ourselves. You know, Sam Weinberg and his work at Stanford with the Stanford History Education Group. Uh, have created assessments that have all the materials you need and the, um, the lesson ideas. I mean, I think we've got some great opportunities to think about building on resources that we have to, to push the kinds of student achievement we want. And finally, you know, I mean, people said, oh, we don't really have a plan. We don't have a plan. Um, well, you know, the, the issue is we all have to have a plan. We have to, we have to think about the kinds of ways that, that uh, we're moving forward. We've got um, classroom teachers who are thinking about and being thoughtful about implementing the Common Core Standards. We've got school districts who are doing it. You know, Los Angeles Unified has a whole um, comprehensive example of how civics can and is corp co incorporated into the Common Core Standards. They've got a fabulous document called Preparing Students for College, Career, and Citizenship um, that you can find on, online, and we'll, I'm sure we'll send the links. Um, the talk about how they specifically intentionally connect the Common Core standards with uh, civics expectations. You know, we've got the LDC units that we talked about before, um, and even at state levels. I mean, people are starting to create visions of a plan. Um, you know, one of the great things again that talks about leadership is the idea that we've got um, <laughs> that we've got. Our, folks like Stephen Lazar writing an article critiquing the work that's being done in New York around the state standards. I think that's fantastic. I mean, he's showing, you know, leading out in, in terms of his concern that the that the New York standards are again falling into this trap of way too many concepts instead of some of the really big, deep questions that we want kids to be struggling with. Um, and then today we've got um, the new. C3 framework that um, states have been working on uh, around the country um, that will shortly be released that's looking at a framework for standards for social studies uh, that states can use ac across the country. Uh, the C3 framework specifically focuses on um, college career and civic readiness and, and looks at how the common core state standards, the literacy expectations in the ELA are tied to um, our work in history, our work in civics, our work in geography and in economics, and how they're, we're all heading in the right, we're, we're all heading in the same direction. We're all heading in the same goal of college and career readiness, but it is absolutely mind-boggling to think that social studies wouldn't be seen as an essential component 
of of our work. Um, you know, as the Common Core has been rolled out around the country, it's faced criticism. It's faced, you know, as 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 it should, as anything should, in terms of something that where we care about students and we care about kids, um, and we want the best for our children. And what I can tell you is, we consistently have um, people wondering about the Common Core and what it's what it means and what's the, what are the implications and where did it come from and what are the federal strings attached and all of that and I just continually remind people to look at the document to just do a close reading of the standards and to ask themselves well what is it that you find objectionable I mean these standards are pushing us in new ways and anytime there's a push it's a challenge anytime there's a uh, a change. It can be hard, but I I just can't think of very many people in this country who don't want their kids to be successful at the at the kinds of skills that are laid out in the core standards. And what we know is that a great social studies program is going to help reach those goals. Um, that's the exciting piece. When I think about this whole idea about kids can't, I think it gets back to what Don was asking about before, is this this whole reason we're in education, the reason we're, you know, we care about this profession, the reason we're, you know, listening to a webinar um, and thinking about our own practice and wanting to make sure that we um, can make a difference is that we fundamentally believe in the right to rigor for kids that we fundamentally believe that we can expect much of students. We know, um, if we look back at our own memories of our educations, we can remember those teachers who asked a lot of us. And they didn't just ask a lot of us, they gave us the skills to be successful. They helped us master the kinds of, of goals that we wanted to achieve. They were the, the people who coached us along in our lives, and we it's going to be hard. There's no 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 way to 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 say that in any other way. It is going to be hard to implement the core standards. I have teachers who say, you know, it's difficult to teach students how to write an argument when I'm not very good at it myself. It's pretty hard to vet all these websites and check them for bias because sometimes it's hard for me not to fall into the trap of forgetting that, oh, I better check the source here and think about it. But we are, we're in education because we're optimistic. We're in education because we believe in planting that oak tree in that little seedling knowing that we may never live to actually, you know, see any shade growing out of it. But we believe in the abilities of these kids. Um, one of the really resonant phrases that I remember from the Bush administration was this idea of the soft bigotry of low expectations. And we are in the habit of, high, of having high expectations. That's what we've actually absolutely have to transform into, a belief that kids can do it and that if kids can't, it's job security for us because, boy, we have a lot of work to do. So. The cool thing is, when I think about things like in world languages, people are talking about kids being able to do things in a, in a standpoint of can-do statements. They actually have written their proficiency standards for world languages as kids can do these things. And I think that's what we have to continually think about in our own classrooms, in our own work, is that we can do this, and kids can do this. They are capable. We, we do not have to have the status quo of 60% of students heading off to college having to enter remedial courses in reading and mathematics. We have an obligation and a shared attribution to, um, to commit to that. So we have to stay the course. We have to just buck it up. Um, I just say, what are you going to do? You know, move back from uh, high standards expectation to something, to something less? There's there's no alternative but moving forward with um, these kinds of core standards, and I I really believe that we're ready to launch. I think that the challenge for us is getting really clear about 
and arguing for the central role of social studies for understanding that kids have a right, a right to rigor, that in the elementary grades they have a right to social studies every day, not just Tuesdays and Thursdays when we're going to have fun time, but every day, that we have to continually work together to figure out how we integrate and implement those goals, but we can do it. Um, it's still our Sputnik moment, and I think that social studies education will only be better um, in the years ahead because, frankly, um, we have now this attention to standards, this, this commitment to a path ahead, um, and at least when we know the path, then we know where we're heading. And so I'm excited about the future. Well, this is great, Robert, and thank you, number one, for your time, um, your leadership, your optimism, uh, and enthusiasm for the social studies and, and its place within the Common Core State Standards. Um, we've had some great questions so far from folks. We're still getting a few more. Um, we're going to gather them, and we're going to get those in front of Robert in just a minute. Um, before we do that, uh, you know, just taking a look at sort of the challenges that um, our team at Herf Jones Nystrom faces as a publisher, uh, you know, the educators that we serve come to us and say, well, you know, we've been relying on you for all this great content for years and years. How can you help us? And I thought it would be worthwhile just to take a look at how things have really changed. Um, just very briefly with the time we have left, I don't want to take away from the questions, but um, looking at an activity sheet that we've recently developed uh, that we'll be coming out with in all of our programs going forward um, for the next school year. Uh, just taking a look at what we're asking students to be able to do. And if you look at the highlighted question here from a, um, a history uh, program, we're, say, we're asking what does the caption explicitly say, and this is referring a student back to an atlas, what does the caption explicitly say uh, Native Americans built or made? And there's just this real change, I think, that is worth pointing out, where we're asking students, what does this explicitly say, that just that whole notion, and then taking it a step further, not just what does, what does the text explicitly say, but then based on that information, what can you infer that Native Americans also have ma or also made? And you'll see other examples of this um, you know, throughout this sheet. And I thought it was worth pointing out also that you know, this ties in perfectly um, with the Common Core State Standard for Grade 5 for ELA and Reading for Informational Text. Again, um, what you talked about, Robert, and students and the rigor and what we're going to challenge them to do and the fact that they're going to be able to rise to the occasion. Speaking from my own experience, um, you know, I have three young students in school and I'm seeing a first grader being asked words like, what can you infer? And, you know, I think in, in the first time I saw that, I was a little bit startled, like how do we expect a six-year-old to understand this? But I think your point is really well taken. Students need to be told. And that's what the role of the educator is, to educate them about this academic vocabulary, and from there challenge them, and they will rise to the occasion. So just curious, you know, is this really what you're talking about? Is, you know, Right. what we're showing here in, in this type of a, an activity. Yeah, I think it's about intentionality. It's about getting, it's about saying, if we really mean this, then what does that mean? How do we operationalize this? How do we, if we want kids to understand what something explicitly says, then let's use that language. Let's mm -hmm. get kids doing the kinds of things in our assignments that support these kinds of goals. So, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, again, for us as a publisher, this is this is what we're, we're rising to the occasion to do to help, you know, the folks that we serve in the education world, and that is really building these um, lessons from the bottom up, not aligning, but building from the bottom up uh, so they're built to the actual standards. So um, I'm going to actually take us forward, uh, let's see here, and remind folks that we've been tweeting um, throughout Robert's presentation um, from our account at HJ Nystrom and using the hashtag that you see in front of you. Um, remind folks that we are on Facebook where we are typically posting the types of articles that have been mentioned here, carrying on conversations with educators like yourselves about these issues. Uh, we'll continue to put more and more resources and information uh, to help educate you. 
um, out on our Facebook page. And if you want to visit our website, we are at herfjonesnystrom.com. So Robert, with the time we have left, I'm going to give you a few more questions here. We have several, so thanks to all those who are sending them in. Um, so what are the next steps um, in the process for the social studies? Um, and sort of a related question, um, what's your advice for building support for this within a district when the emphasis is so much on reading and math? How do you get people involved? If, if you don't mind, I'd like to just put in my two cents on this real quickly. Um, my suggestion would be getting involved with the National Council for Social Studies. As Robert said, I'd like to echo what he said, is just being part of this conversation in general. I mean, you are taking time out of your busy day to have this, uh, to, to sit in on this webinar take that to the next step and really get involved with the National Council. Let your voice be heard at the state level with your own state council. And if you are a Twitter user, I even suggest making sure that you're building your network of people that you're connected with, not just around the country, but around the world. Um, I, I would highly endorse and give a shout out to the crew that handles the Monday night SS chat. Uh, on Twitter. I think they do a fantastic job tackling all these types of subjects and more and letting you know as an educator you're not out there alone. There are other resources for you and people to connect with. Um, so th those, that would be my two cents. But Robert, yeah. what do you suggest as next steps? Uh, you know, is it uh, with NCSS? What, you know, how do you build support? Yeah, and I think that entering into that marketplace of ideas, I mean, we talk about encouraging people to be civically engaged, well, that means that we've got to do it as well. It means we've got to talk to board members, to principals, to curriculum designers, to all the people at both the elementary and the secondary level. But essentially, when we talk about uh, the importance of the elementary level for social studies instruction, that the white paper that um, Herb Jones Nystrom just recently put out is, is really great research that can back up your argument that we owe it to kids to build the kind of content knowledge that, that is going to help them be successful. And I think folks can find the white paper that Robert's referring to. Thanks for your comments about that, by the way. Um, that is on the Herf Jones Nystrom Facebook page. I think it's easy to find. If, if it's not, we'll put it up um, as a more recent post so that people can get a hold of that resource. Um, here's another question coming from an eighth grade American history teacher. How do you, how do you suggest that educators deal with the challenge of so little time to expose students to so much history. Yeah, I think that one of the things we're really discovering is that we've got to we've got to um, slow down and go deep. We have to we have to begin to understand that what part of what we're doing is is raising children that will be lifelong learners, and um, the incessant race to cover uh, is very often at the detriment of any kind of depth of understanding for kids. So. That's, it's always going to be a challenge, but slow down and dig into what's essential. Great. I think we really have time for one more question. So um, that one here says, what is the relationship between content and skills um, and literacy for social studies common core curricula? Yeah, I think they go hand in hand. I don't think there's one or the other. I don't think you have to argue that you have to throw out all the content and just focus on skills. It, you, you know, you, when we think about any other kind of performance, any other kind of work, and if we, if we focus in on the kinds of instruction we do with students as performance, as assessment, if we're going to have students make a debate or craft an argument in writing, then they're going to be developing those skills, but they have to have something to write about. They have to have some, some content that they're arguing about or making a presentation on. So I think it's a false, um, we get into this false argument if we think that it's only one or the other. It's, we definitely have to be sailing together down that stream. Excellent. Well, again, uh, Robert, thank you on behalf of uh, Herf Jones Nystrom, but on behalf of the roughly 1,000 people who registered for this event, um, we really appreciate you leading us down this better path. Uh, for social studies, uh, given the situation with Common Core State Standards. I think you've given people plenty to think about. Um, and again, we'd ask that uh, folks join us online to continue the conversation, use us as a resource. Um, and again, Robert, can't thank you enough for your time today. We'll, we have recorded this, 
So if you want to share this with your colleagues, the email with the link to the recording will be coming fairly soon, uh, within the next day. And again, uh, Robert, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, everyone have a great day. Thanks again.